Um, so uh, we are halfway through doing a graph. Uh, the graph of the graph of this function. The graph of two x squared divided by x squared minus one. Um, so, section five in my favorite chapter was uh, just a summary of things we already know uh, to help us catch a curve, which is a very useful skill to have. Um, so, it just gives you a list of things to try. It doesn't mean you have to go through them all, uh, but it's probably a nice list to follow. So we started following it. Um, we figured out that this function was defined everywhere except for uh, plus minus one. I don't know why I wrote one there. Oh, that's a plus minus. Uh -huh. Uh, we figured out that all the intercepts are in the origin. We figured out that the function is here, which is great, uh, because it means that if I reflect, it stays the same, and that means I only need to draw half of it, and the other half is just going to be a reflection. Uh, so, for example, we figured out that x equals 1 is a vertical asymptote, and then that automatically tells me that x equals negative 1 is a vertical asymptote as well. And if it comes from the uh, if from the left it goes down and from the right it goes up, on this side, well, on this side it's going to do the symmetrical thing. So it's going to go up from the left and down from the right. Uh, we figured out the limit at infinity, which was two. It it told us it was a horizontal asymptote. This graph happens to not cross the asymptote, but do keep in mind that that is a thing that can definitely happen uh, that a graph crosses an asymptote. And that's where we got. And we didn't get to use the derivative for anything. So now we're going to see where it's increasing and decreasing. Although at this point, we can probably guess. But let's confirm our suspicions. Uh, we're going to see where it has maxes and mins and where it's, it's curving up or down. <clears throat> and then we're going to move on to 4.7. So um, how do we know if a function is increasing or decreasing? Well, if, it, if the function is differentiable, which means that has a derivative, which it does, uh, it's just asking if the derivative is positive or negative, or where it's positive or negative. So let's uh, let's take that derivative. Woo. Um, what should I do? I can think of two things I should do. Uh, two things I could do. Well, I only need to do them. I only need to do this one way. No, I can think of three things. Closure. Closure. Ah, uh, quotient, quotient. Um, quotient rule. That's one thing, yeah. Um, I I could have also, since this is a function where I plugged in x squared, I could also have done the the chain rule and do an easier, turn, turn it into, well, I have to do two things, but I do an easier quotient rule. Uh, Jake, L'Hopital's rule is just for limits. Uh, if by using L'Hopital's rule, you mean taking the derivative of the top and the bottom, that is not going to work. Um, thanks, Dustin. So, uh, quotient rule. So you have the squares of the denominator. 
and then you have low d high minus high d low could be worse so all the all the everything is a polynomial so derivatives are easy 4x uh, is a power rule and then x squared tends into 2x and as you might have guessed this is going to simplify i could have simplified this before i did the quotient rule too so if i multiply this out x squared minus 1 times 4x i get 4x cubed minus 4x by multiplying 4x by both factors and the second the this one has a four and three x's. And let's not expand the denominator because I don't see a point to that. And now, now that it's a square, uh, I know that it's always positive, which is nice. So the four x cubes cancel out. So, um, Where is this function positive? Where is, no, let's see, where is this function zero? Uh, negative four X. Well, it's zero if the denominator is not zero. If the denominator is zero, it's not defined. That just happens at plus minus one, where I'm not looking at it either way. And the numerator is zero. So negative 4x has to be 0, which means that x has to be 0. So x equals 0 is the only critical point. Um, and where is this function? Where is this derivative positive? Would we have to do like the second derivative test? We don't have to, but I will. Um, but I'm, I'm not there yet. <clears throat> so I'm just looking at this formula and trying to figure out which values of x give me a positive number. So um, when is the so when is the numerator positive? When is negative four x a positive number? Like before, like. And the negatives, like at like before zero. If the negatives, if I if exactly, thank you, Dustin. If you make x positive, negative four x is going to be negative because there's going to be one negative sign. If I make x negative, uh, I'm going to have two negative signs, which is going to make it positive. And when is this degree four polynomial positive? Um, when is the square of x squared minus 1 positive? I see your Isn't it positive for all values of x because it's being squared? Exactly. It's positive um, for all values of x because it's a square. So it's not if, it's just always. Um, you got the weird lines. So you, oh, I'm outside. Ah, uh, regrets. Mm, um, Sure. 
so if the numerator is only is positive for the negative numbers and the denominator is always positive, this means that the quotient of the two is positive only with x when x is negative. And because of the, because the function is even, I only need to figure out half the function. Uh, yeah, have the values of x. So so um, the derivative is positive for negative values of x. Um, not equal to negative one because this is not in the domain. So um, f is increasing for uh, at all the negative values. So um, if I draw the asymptotes again, negative one and one and two. And I draw my function. Uh, so I'm supposed to draw something increasing. So on all the next, no, it goes to zero, zero. So here, the whole thing has to be increasing. Except at x equals negative one, where well nothing is happening. There's no function there. Um, so it keeps increasing, gets to infinity, um, and then starts increasing again from negative infinity. And the right half is just um, mirrored. Is that because it's an even function? Yeah. Okay. So I don't need to repeat any any calculations. And well, um, if an even function, you can memorize this. Um, if an even function is increasing, on the other side, it becomes decreasing. But I think, why would you ever memorize this if you could just draw a picture and saw that if I if I draw on if the left side is going up, the right side is going down. So you can clearly see that here it becomes decreasing. So um, we also said um, now that we know the um, the derivative. we have that zero is the only critical point. Well, based on what I drew, is it a max or a min or neither? Um, I think it's neither. Yeah, I got a vote for neither, and I got a vote for min. Uh, so someone, I guess someone has to justify. Uh, someone has to defend their position. Um, I think it's neither because it's an, I don't, I guess, I don't know. Is it because it's like a upside down parabola? Okay. So it's it's just continuing to, because although it does go from negative to positive on one side, it goes back down. So it goes, it's going up, then it's going down. Yeah. Um. So. You can say both, Matthew. You can say neither. You can say both. 
Um, so the function is increasing to the left and it's uh, decreasing to the right. So the function, it looks like an upside down parabola. Um, that's a that's a relative maximum point. If you're, it's the this is the 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 summit of the graph. So the graph the graph is the the black curve, and and around zero this is the highest point. So. It's a, it's a relative maximum. So sorry, you you both got it wrong. Um, because yeah, I thought it was relative and not like absolute. Oh, that was my next question. Oh, got to it before you. Well, now you have to answer. I Is don't it, know. What I, mean. I definitely know it's at least. It's at least a relative maximum. That's all I'm committing to so far. So is it an absolute maximum? So that's asking, is the function ever bigger than the value at zero, which is um, which is zero? Oh, oh perfect. Okay, more slide, I guess. Um, so, I'm pretty sure this is what a function looks like at this point. Is this the highest point? This is the highest point. It's, so we know it's a relative maximum, which means it's the highest point among somewhere close to it. So among these, it's definitely the highest point. The question is, is there a highest point, a higher point elsewhere in the graph? But they go to affinity, so you wouldn't know. I think I know. It goes to if it goes to infinity, that means it's getting as big as I want. Uh, so you're all correct. It, it's it's not. Um, oh wait, you're saying it is the highest point. I don't know what you're saying. Yes or no to. Um, this point is higher. Okay, uh, yeah, the, I don't know what you mean by technically, but um, there is a high, there, there are a bunch of higher points. Um, this is the same as asking, is there x with f of x bigger than f of zero, which we've already computed, it's, uh, it's zero. And the answer, the answer is, Yes, there is. You can see it. You can see it already in the picture because it goes to infinity. Uh, but you pick anything, uh, anything bigger than one, and it looks like it's going to be. Remember, this was x equals one. So f of two is two times two squared divided by two squared minus one squared. This is a positive number. No, not squared. Still a positive number, uh, eight thirds. So, uh, so zero. This point is only a relative max. 
there you go. Uh, so, so finally, probably for this function, it's not going to help us much further because we already have a great picture of it. But let's see where it's um, uh, concave up or down in cavity. So I have my function, my derivative that I computed before. It was negative 4x divided by x squared minus 1 squared. So I need to take the derivative of that. Um, and I don't see any way to do that other than the quotient rule. So to give it deep breath, um, this generally that's generally required to do the quotient rule. And just get to it. So um, low d high minus um, just write a lot of brackets because then this negative sign has like a seventy percent chance of messing with you and giving you a wrong answer. Uh, and then high d low. So if you need to take the derivative of x squared minus one squared, oof, it's fine. Um, we're strong, we're gonna do this. So the derivative of negative four x is just negative four. And now I have, let's start simplifying this, um, two positives become, two negatives become a positive. So I have positive four x, and then this I could expand into x to the fourth minus two x squared plus one, and then take the derivative. Or I could, or I could not expand and use a chain rule. And using the chain rule, it's using the chain rule is the, is the best option um, because things are going to simplify, and I want things to simplify. Otherwise, uh, my life is going to be harder, and we want to be as lazy as possible. So the derivative of the outside applied to the inside. So the outside is the square. And then the derivative of the inside is the derivative of x squared minus 1, which is just 2x. And now I'm, I'm happy because I see that there's x squared minus 1 everywhere. Um, so these are gonna, these are gonna cancel out. So I should factor one of them out. Negative four x squared minus one plus, uh, that's four times two times two, that's 16 x squared. No, to the fourth, or maybe cubed, and then one extra, and these cancel, and now, um, let's see, let's be careful with that negative sign again, negative 4x squared plus 4 plus 16x squared. divided by x squared minus one cubed. Ooh. I'm suspicious of this answer. <clears throat> I am Oh, no. oh yeah, of course, this is 12x squared plus four. Um, so when you have, when you do a second derivative of a fraction, you always, you, you're gonna have probably a square in the denominator and, and things are very likely to cancel. Um, 
that's how you do the derivative. And if you if you don't factor them out, it's for example, it's a lot harder to see if it's positive or negative. So uh, so let's see when the second derivative is positive and negative. So um, we figured out that the derivative, the second derivative is, um, is this fraction. So when is 12x squared plus four positive? All values of x. All values of x. Um, exactly. Thank you. Uh, so x squared is positive or zero. Four is positive. So you take you're adding two positive numbers. So that's great. So this is going to have the sign of the denominator. So when um, when is the denominator positive? Well, this is the cube of a number. The cube of a positive number is positive. The cube of a negative number is negative. So this is positive exactly when x squared minus 1 is positive. And x squared is bigger than 1. Got to be careful here. Because um, it's not when x is bigger than 1. Is when x is bigger than one or x is smaller than negative one. I guess you take square roots. And then you have that one is smaller than the absolute value of x. The square root of the square is not the number if the number is negative. So um, if we only look at the positive numbers, The second derivative is positive if we have x bigger than 1. So our graph, like you would expect based on the pictures I have drawn, um, here it curves down. It's, it's concave down. Here it curves up. And then if you if you do the mirror image, well, it's going to be uh, first concave up, then concave down. So so that's it. Are there any questions? Any more questions? Actually, you didn't ask anything yet. You just gave me answers. Is that a negative one on the right? Uh, yeah. So if you if you go graph it with the computer, you see that we we did we actually did amazingly well. I mean the scale might look different. I guess I didn't do good with the scale, but I got the shape exactly right. Uh, here's an asymptote. Here's the other the other asymptote. And here's the third asymptote. And this is exactly what I drew. On the positive numbers, it's um, on the positive numbers, it's always going down. But then Oh, great. Didn't work at all. Um, then it's curving down before one and curving up 
before uh, after one keep in mind being less decreasing is the same thing as being more increasing and here's the local maximum the local maximum means if i zoom in it looks like a maximum eventually but it's not a global maximum because at all of these points the function is bigger than zero which is the value here and it gets close to the asymptotes as we promised and and that's it and if you do all these things you can draw really good pictures all right uh moving on so if you go to the syllabus um section 4.6 has a has skip written in all caps um so i'm moving to 4.7 4.7 i'm moving to optimization yeah 4.7 optimization problems so um more word problems uh grown grown but this is the reason we do calculus there's more i mean there's more than one reason but this is the big one what's an optimization problem optimization means finding finding the way to make a function the biggest or the smallest possible um and that function tends to be the money you make um so this is a thing you care about in real life um so i wrote i wrote down just random optimization problems i could think of um not a, not all of them you can solve using Coq1. Not all of them does humanity know how to solve yet. Or we know how to guess, but we don't have an exact answer. Um, so, and, and some depends on the situation. So, um, problems that show up all the time is how much of a thing should I make to make the maximum profit? So the question is always, what decisions should I take to get the the maximum or the minimum something? So to make the most profit, how much uh, something should I make? What the price should be? Because you know, if you if you make something very expensive, no one buys it. Um, you make no money. If you make uh, something very cheap, maybe people will buy it, but you make no money. So probably you need to. Uh, charge something between zero and infinity dollars for any product or service you offer. Uh, where should I advertise my blog? Um, or my whatever. Uh, there's more advertising, it's not bring more people. At some point, it doesn't matter anymore, and you're just wasting your money. Probably zero advertising gets you nowhere. Maybe not. Um, but there's I mean, it's not always so obvious how things are a function, but they are. Um, for example, a very hard optimization problem is where should I put a, in the map of Baton Rouge, where should I put a bus line? Where should buses go through? How many bus lines should there be? How many bus stops should there be? How far apart should they be? This is, this is like an incredibly complicated problem. Um, uh, even if you're like simulating this in a, in a video game, how much should taxes be? And I guess this could be an ethical problem as well. Uh, I'm not gonna get into, but say you wanted to make the most money for the for the state, then this is an optimization problem. Or maybe you want something else to be optimized, in which case this is a different optimization problem. Um, a very interesting problem, which, uh, well, is, um, there's 180 people, 80 million people using Netflix, and each person out of the stuff that's there has watched a handful of shows and they've given a thumbs up or down to a handful of shows. And then you try to figure out what uh, movie do you recommend to each person? Or try to guess the rating they're going to give uh, a movie they haven't yet, yet watched. Um, <clears throat> this doesn't look like an optimization problem. But if you rephrase it, like, I need to, out of all the possible predictions, I need to make the best one, the one that's gonna have the smallest error, all of a sudden it becomes an optimization problem. Not a cost one problem, but definitely an optimization problem. And I have this Wikipedia page 
open because um, Netflix, apparently 10 years ago, Netflix was offering a million dollars to the best solution. And they gave a million dollars to someone or some people who, who made this better by 10.06%. Um, so, um, you know, obviously Netflix, Amazon, they have some solution to this problem. Uh, they, they don't have the best solution, but even for, even for a, an estimate, you can, well, um, they're very important to some people. Um, what do I do in general? Any decision, how do I make it so I have the least environmental impacts or how do I have the most, I guess, also an ethical problem? Do you want to destroy the world fast or slow, I guess? Um, a problem a student gave me last semester was how do I make the smallest storm uh, that students will still live in, uh, which is a problem you care about. So some of these things are probably for the good of humanity. Some are evil, evil, some are neutral, but I mean, I don't think math or science is inherently good or evil. Um, you can use it for both, but either way, um, you should learn it because even if you, people can use it for evil, it just means you're knowing your enemy. Maybe you don't happen to not want the world to be destroyed. Um, so, um, so this is what optimization problems are. Um, but none of these are problems you can solve in 10 minutes. Um, so let me write a problem I can solve in 10 minutes. Uh, and obviously, I'm not going to, you're not going to get a some worker problem that Netflix will give you a million dollars for. And if I did, you shouldn't submit it to me as homework. You should give it to Netflix and make a million dollars. <clears throat> so, um, so here's a problem. Um, you have, I mean, sure, if only. It's not like I'm solving the problem either, you know. You have um, a thousand feet, uh, no, not a thousand. Oh yeah, you do have a thousand. A uh, fence. And you want to make a rectangle. A rectangle uh, next to a, a river. Uh, being the greedy bastard that you are, um, you want to fence in the biggest area. So basically all work problems, the strategy, the strategies are the same. And Maybe this is a result of there being no general strategy, but generally writing the information, um, write the information you're giving clearly. Uh, draw pictures if there's anything that can be drawn. Uh, give letters to quantities. Generally, just the more organized you can be writing the information, the the more obvious the solution is going to be when you look at what you've written. Um, and for an optimization problem, concretely, you need to write um, a function, decide if you want to minimize or maximize it.
um, try to make it only involve one letter. Because we don't know how to find the minimum of a function of more than one variable. Um, this is something you learn in Calc, in calc 3. Uh, but we're getting there. <clears throat> and then, well, and then that's it. And then, and then, and then do it. So these are the general strategies. Okay, so um, let's draw a picture. So there's a river and it's the river is straight. And then I'm trying to make a rectangle next to it. Um, and I'm trying to catch, so this will make this land in here my property, I guess that's how it works, right? You you make a fence and whatever falls inside is yours. And now the question is, um, uh, what is the, well, what is the question? The question is what, what letters do I write here? What data do I have? What quantity can I call by a letter? What quantities? Thousand feet. Um, what is the thousand feet? Would that be the perimeter? Um, except for the part of the river, which doesn't need um, which doesn't need a fence. So perimeter minus. Uh, yeah. So, how would you? So, what numbers do you need to describe um, this shape, the solution? If you were to give me any possible rectangle, how would you? You would have to probably give me some quantities. The length and the width. The length and the width. Yeah. So let's just call these by some letters. Um, So, um, so then, are there other quantities that are important here? Um, Maybe the area, like your property? Definitely the area, um, because the area, I'm going to call A is the thing I want to make the largest. So, um, so, That's, I think, all the quantities um, that are going to be relevant. And I, I think the question now is how are they related? Um, y, x, y. So Sam says um, that I can, if I know the, the sites, I know the area. So that's great. That means I have a, I have a, a formula for the, for the quantity that I want to maximize. So the only question is how do I make X times Y the largest? Um, the problem is that they have, that there's two letters. Um, So when there's too many letters, what you gotta do is you gotta find a relation between the, the letters so that you can 
substitute one for the other. You could do implicit differentiation as well, but um, nah. it's kind of kind of annoying to do that. Uh, so how are x and y related? Can can x and y be anything? Can they, for example, can I make if because if they can be anything, that means that the area can be as big as I want. Just make x and y very large. Make it take a lot of fence. X plus two y. There you go. Um, they're related, like Sam just told me, by the the fact that I only have so much fence. Um, x plus y plus y, which is x plus two y. Is uh, the total fence uh, length? So I can use I, I can use at most a thousand feet, but I think everyone can agree if I use more fence, um, if I don't use it all, I could be just using more and getting more fence. So um, really, I should I should make them I should make x, x plus two y equal to a thousand. <clears throat> if I do this, um, because, oh, well, the, the big reason being, I don't know how to solve that problem with an inequality. Uh, that would require some interesting stuff. Uh, so, Stuff that I only vaguely remember from undergrad, honestly. Uh, so um, if there, if I say they're equal, that means I can solve for one in terms of the other. I can solve for x in terms of y. So here I'm going to choose whichever is easiest and then plug in to the formula for A. Well, so the easiest is to solve for x. x is 1,000 minus 2y. And that means the area 1,000 minus 2y times y, which probably is just better if I write as 1,000y minus 2y squared. So now the problem becomes, find the max of the function. So the function is a, a and the variable is y. And it's 1,000y minus 2y squared. Um, and let's just, so, well, there's some constraints, like I can only use positive, um, positive area, and also x is bigger than zero, so a thousand minus two y is going to be bigger than zero, so I can only use 500 feet, right, the smallest I can make it is make the height zero. And the, the tallest I can make it is make the height 500 and make the, the width equal to zero. So just take the derivative, make it equal to zero. And the extreme value theorem is going to tell you, um, is going to tell you that the critical points, the critical points are going to contain the maxes and mins. So if you make this equal to zero, solving this, you have 4y equal to 1,000, which makes y equal to 250. So I have three critical points, y equals 250, y equals, and then the endpoints, 500. This one corresponds to making half a square. 
this was corresponds to making a line. And this was corresponds to making a, a line as well. So um, this is the best. And, and there you go. One thing I like about optimization problems is that you can try to guess a solution beforehand. And sometimes you guess right, and sometimes you're surprised. But this is a question that definitely you could ask yourself. You can try to figure out the answer, and you really need calculus to do it. All right, um, that's all. So tomorrow, I will do more examples of these. Could you go back to the previous page real quick? Yeah, uh, I'm going to stop recording and um,